Now, somebody helped me out, you know, in the bulletin today. Um, I'm not going to talk about Jesus vs. religion. I'm going to talk about Jesus versus religion. Amen. And uh, those things happen, so we'll move right along. But uh, Jesus versus religion. I want to begin reading at verse 14 of Mark chapter 2. And uh, we're going to cover all the way through the end of the chapter, but I will not read all of those verses. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of customs, custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Jesus versus religion. Amen. One of the strangers and saddest features surrounding the life of our Lord Jesus Christ was the fact of the fierce and sometimes very violent religious opposition that he constantly encountered. As we move through the Gospel of Mark, we see this rising hostility on the part of the religious leaders in the day of Jesus. To begin with, you will remember that we were told last Sunday in verse 7 that the scribes and the Pharisees uh, pondered in their own heart without the courage to come up front. They reason within their own hearts, why does this man commit blasphemies? For who can forgive sins but God only? And then as we move along in this second chapter, we will begin to see the hostility and the opposition becoming more open. First of all, they reasoned within their hearts. And then secondly, they went to the disciples of Jesus. And they said to the disciples of Jesus, they rather asked different accusing questions about his actions and his behavior. And then after going to the disciples of Jesus, then they finally built up sufficient courage to confront Jesus himself. And they asked Jesus about his actions, activities, and behavior. And then you will see it coming somewhat to a climax in chapter 3 and verse 6, where it says that the Pharisees took counsel with the Herodians in order to see how they might destroy him. And so you're going to see as we move through this book constantly a rising hostility on the part of religion 
toward Jesus. I find it amazing that the only person who's ever lived a sinless life, the one who came to fulfill the highest hopes of their religion and their aspirations, when he finally arrived, they despised him. They hated him. And they did everything they knew how to do to finally destroy him. Now I've come today to say to us that perhaps one of the most dangerous and deadly things on planet earth is religion. There are few things in this world that are as wicked and as cruel as is religion. Harry Emerson Fosdick said that uh, religion is like water. On one hand, it can cleanse and refresh, while on the other hand, it can engulf and drown. And history tells us that uh, the bloodiest wars of all were those that involved uh, the crusaders. You see, religion can cut your heart out and believe that God ordained your dying. Have I got a witness here? Religion is a dangerous thing. And so what we have here is Jesus having to confront that kind of violent, deadly religion. If you want to see how deadly, dangerous religion it is in this modern day, look at the eight-year war between Iran and Iraq. It's a war of religion. Consider all of the killings and the murder and all that has gone on in Ireland when you hear about the killings and the war between the Catholics and the Protestants all being done in the name of religion. And so Jesus here meets this kind of dangerous religion and uh, whenever Jesus meets and uh, comes in contact, confronts religion, the sparks will fly. Whenever Jesus comes in contact with religion, there will always be a controversy. Because, you see, there is a distinguishable difference between Jesus and religion. Everybody has some kind of religion. But not everybody will have Jesus. You see, I told you that uh, there's a difference between Jesus and uh, religion. Religion is man's attempt to reach God, while Jesus is God's attempt to reach man. Religion is works, while Jesus is grace. Religion is membership, while Jesus is a relationship. Are you going to help me here? You can be in the church, and you can be very religious without salvation. You can keep all of the rules and the regulations of religion and not be saved. Jesus said on one occasion to a very religious man, ye must be born again. He said it to Nicodemus who was a ruler, a religious man. You must be saved. And as somebody here looking at me right now you got religion. <laughs> I see you with your Bible. I know you got religion. I see you in your choir robe. You in the pulpit. You on the front row. You an officer in the church. You, you have religion. You religious enough to be here every Sunday. You got enough religion to be here even when the weather is bad. But that's not the question today. The question is, do you know Jesus? Because there's a difference between religion and Jesus. Now there are three controversies in this passage. 
The first controversy is the association controversy. The second controversy is the fasting controversy. And the third controversy is the Sabbath controversy. The association, the fasting, and uh, the Sabbath controversy. Are you going to help me here today? And we want to take a look at how when Jesus encountered religion, these three controversies broke out. Now the first controversy, as I said, is the association controversy. Look down in verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him, meaning Jesus, eat with the publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Are you listening here? Ah, uh, when they saw Jesus eat and drink with the scum of the earth, they raised the association controversy. Now let me see if I can uh, set the stage so you can better understand uh, this controversy. One day Jesus was walking along the seaside and he came to what is called uh, the receipt of customs. And there sat a man by the name of Levi, who would later be known as Matthew. Now Levi was known as a tax collector. Have I got a witness here? And uh, tax collectors in those days were despised. He was known as a tax collector. That was his job. In other words, he had been appointed to this position by Herod Antipas. In order to collect taxes from the Jewish people for the Roman government. Now if a contest had ever been held in order to choose or select the most hated man in the whole area, Levi or Matthew would have easily won the contest. Because in those days, tax collectors were hated and despised. They were despised, number one, because they were considered to be dishonest men. You see, the Roman government gave tax collectors the authority to fleece the people. They had the freedom to charge whatever they thought they could get out of the people. And so tax collectors were wealthy men at the expense of the people. And so they were despised and hated. And they were despised, secondly, because they were looked upon as traitors to the nation. Somebody here ought to help me. They were considered as traitors to the nation because they worked in collaboration with the Roman government. And so one day, here was this hated, despised man, Levi, sitting in the seat of custom. And along comes Jesus with his uh, magnificent magnetism and only says two words, follow me. And the Bible says that Levi, Matthew, arose and followed Jesus. <laughs> Are you with me here? Now there's no doubt in my mind that Matthew, uh, it cost Matthew more than it cost any other disciple to follow Jesus. Because Matthew was wealthy as a result of being a tax collector. You see, the other disciples, uh, they could have gone back to their former business of fishing. The fish was still there. The boats were still there. The father was still there. Have I got a witness? The nets were still there, and sometimes... They did return to the old job of fishing, but not so with Levi. When Levi walked away from the tax table, there was no way back. There was no way the Roman government would give him back his old job. So when he stood up to follow Jesus, he burned the bridge behind him. 
Then my sanctified imagination looked like I hear Levi saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. Have I got a witness? And uh, when he resigned from his job, I believe it's verse 15, that said, uh, Levi threw a party for Jesus at his house. They had a banquet. They had a feast. And he invited all of his friends. And the only friends he had were publicans and sinners. Everybody else hated him and despised him too much to come to his party. So all he could invite were fellow publicans, tax collectors, and sinners. And right in the middle of the party, Levi stood up. And he said to his fellow sinners and tax collectors, I've got news for you. I've resigned my job. I'm leaving the profession and I plan to walk with Jesus. I'm turning my back on a lucrative business in order to get in the road uh, with the master. And then he gave his testimony. He began to talk about what Jesus had done in his life. How Jesus came into his life and the change that had been made. And then it says at the bottom of the verse 15 that he invited his friends to follow him also. <laughs> Have I got a witness? Isn't it, isn't it, isn't it exciting when you see a brand new believer and how on fire they are and how the first thing they want to do is to bring their friends to Jesus. I told you that we were down in, in San Antonio uh, at a national meeting and I led a young white brother to the Lord. He was in there responsible for setting up the room. I led him to the Lord and he left there excited and high on Jesus and only in a few moments he came back <laughs> and bringing one of his friends and said I, bring, I brought him because he needs to get saved too <laughs> have I got a witness here and I've seen people in this very congregation like Billy Johnson right out there when he got saved excited about Jesus and I've seen others in this church when they got saved, excited about Jesus, and they wanted to bring everybody they came in contact with to come to know Jesus. Some of them don't even know how to share Christ. They just say, come on, go to church with me. Come on, let me tell you about what Jesus has done in my life. My brothers and sisters, the best time for you to share Jesus is when you first come to know him. Have I got a witness? The best time is when you first come to know him because there is a tendency. When you come to know Jesus over a period of time, there is a tendency to become isolated from your former friends. There is a tendency to become separated from those who are still lost. Let me ask you, do you have any lost friends? Huh? Do you have any lost friends? Not that you do what they do, but that uh, you've left the door of communication open so that when God <laughs> provides the opportunity, you're going to step in and share Jesus with them. You see, most of us are misunderstanding the gospel and misunderstanding this matter of being separate from the world. It is not a matter of isolation but a matter of insulation. Have I got a witness here? We are not to be of the world, but remain in the world. And therein, we find a difference between Jesus and religion. It says in verse uh, 16 that the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw Jesus eating, and drinking with the publicans and sinners. They went to his disciples and began to raise these accusing kinds of questions. I mean, why is it that he's eating with the scum of the earth? How can he associate 
fraternize, hobnob with these folk. Are you listening here? And the killing thing was uh, they were right about the kinds of people that Jesus was fellowshipping with. They all were a bunch of degenerates, reprobates, sinners. They all were liars and thieves. They all were guilty of rascality and skullduggery. And just about anything else you can uh, imagine. Have I got a witness here? These were the kinds of people that Jesus was having fellowship with. And the Pharisees raised the controversy. How can he, if he claims to be who he is, have fellowship and fraternize with publicans, tax collectors, and uh, sinners. Are you with me here? Jesus, when he heard that question and what they were saying, he says in verse 17, they that are whole have no need of a physician but they that are sick. And so Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are absolutely right. These folk I'm fellowshipping with, they are sick. They are exactly what you call them. They are no good. They are bums. They are sinners. They are the lowliest of the low. But that's exactly why I'm with them. Jesus said, you see, they are sick and I'm a doctor. And a doctor is in the right place when he's in the middle of sick folk. He says, I'm a doctor who still makes house calls. And I stop by Levi's house because he and his friends are all sick. They who are whole, they don't need a physician. Have I got a witness here? But you see, Jesus came not only to heal our physical sickness, but Jesus came primarily to deal with our spiritual sickness. And all we like sheep have gone astray. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We all sin sick and we need uh, Dr. Jesus. Have I got a witness here? And then he says something else in that 17th verse. He said, but they that are sick, I came, touch me, Holy Ghost, not to call uh, the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. Have I got a witness here? He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, do you know why he said, I did not come to call the righteous. Well, it's a very simple reason. It's because the Bible says there are none righteous. No, not one. Check it out in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. He says, I didn't come to call righteous because there are none righteous. Every one of us are unrighteous. And if we have any righteousness at all, it is a righteousness that has been imputed and ascribed unto us, the righteousness of God. And so they said, Jesus, how can you associate with such people? I want to show you here, the difference therein is the difference between Jesus. Religion isolates while Jesus gets involved. <laughs> Do you know that we have a lot of Christians who are so good at two shoes? Do you know we have some churches that get so pious and sanctimonious and self-righteous 
that a sinner feels like a porcupine in a kitten factory? Are you listening here? There are some people who, when they got saved and since they've been saved, uh, they are so holy, they are so pious. If you don't go back home and find out where they came from, they'll try to impress you that they've never done anything wrong. Paul said on one occasion, you better remember where you came from. Have I got a witness here? If you're a sinner in here today, you don't have to shy away from the law. You don't have to take a back seat to anybody because whatever you are, there's an X everything in this church. Everything you can imagine, there's an X something that's been saved by the grace of God. God does not isolate himself from you. He invades your life in order to get involved so he can bring sinners to salvation. He doesn't become involved with sinners so he can be like sinners. He gets involved with sinners so they can come to know the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Therein is our task to get involved with sinners. Not to be like them, but to help them to know the grace and the love of God. Therein is the association controversy. You know what my prayer is for Concord? Whatever else is said about us, that we will learn how to keep our feet on the ground. Regardless of how high God lifts us, that we will keep the common touch. It's all right if lawyers and doctors want to join our church, but be sure that we are open to the common man. <laughs> Whosoever will, let him come. Rich, poor, white, black, green or gray, occidental or oriental, it makes no difference. Whoever you are, if you need Jesus, the rumor ought to get out on Concord that they associate with publicans and sinners to come to know salvation. Now that was a second controversy. And that is the fasting <laughs> controversy. You see down beginning in verse 18 and it says that the scribes and uh, the Pharisees used to fast along with the disciples of John the Baptist. In fact, they were always fasting. The law only required that they fast once a year. But the Pharisees had become so rigid and legalistic that they had brought it down to you had to fast two times a week. They fasted on Mondays and Thursdays. Are you listening here? And uh, when the Pharisees saw that the disciples of Jesus did not fast. They went over and said to Jesus, why is it that the disciples of John fast and we, the Pharisees, we fast, but your disciples do not fast? Again, herein is the difference between Jesus and religion. Religion brings a funeral while Jesus brings a feast. Now you get that down and let me work on it. Are you going to help me? Religion brings a funeral and Jesus brings a feast. Now Jesus said on one occasion, when you fast, do not appear to fast. 
In other words, don't be like the Pharisee. They fast two times a week, but the purpose and the motivation of that fasting is to be seen of men. They disfigure their faces. They get as ugly as they possibly can, trying to look holy and pious trying to impress other folk. There goes a religious man. Are you listening? And so while they were sad and disfiguring their faces, they looked across the street, and while they were looking pitiful, the disciples of Jesus were having a party. And so they went to Jesus and they said, now, why are you having a party while we looking pitiful? Why are you sad? Why are you so happy and we are so sad? Are you listening here? And uh, Jesus began to explain to them between uh, himself, the difference rather, between himself and religion. He says in so many words, religion produces a sadness of a funeral. But Jesus produces the joy of a feast. Are you listening here? Now, come on and let's show you what he says here. He says down in verse 19, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and they shall and then shall they fast in those days now you do know that Jesus is the bridegroom and you do know that we who follow him are the children of the bridegroom and Jesus says now my disciples do not fast because they're not saved and the reason why they're not sad is because the bridegroom is still with them. They don't, you don't have a reason to be sad at a wedding. You make your way into the joy of the bride and the bridegroom. He says, my disciples are happy and enjoying life because I am with them. Are you with me here? Hold me up, Holy Ghost. Now listen, there are some people who cannot handle and deal with joy. Oh yeah. There are some people, they are miserable and if you stay around them, they make you miserable. Their faces are long. They think that the longer the face, the more religion you got. I told you my daddy said that a mule has more religion than anybody. That's why they look like they've been sucking on lemons all of their life. Because somehow in their minds, uh, in order to be right with God, you've got to have this long, serious, sad faith. And they look down on anybody who's happy. That was the problem with uh, the Pharisees. They couldn't stand to see the disciples of Jesus happy. And there are people today who can't stand to see other people happy. They'll lie on you. They'll put rumors out on you. They'll backbite. They'll do anything they can to destroy your happiness. But the Lord says now when he's in your life, you don't have reason to be sad. You've got reason to be joyful. So therefore, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away from me. Because to know Jesus is to have a relationship that produces joy in your life. Have I got a witness? I'm kind of glad the times have changed. Because when I was a boy, it was a, it was a different case couldn't laugh. You couldn't smile. If you smile, they got you. 
heaven now. Bless the Lord for my dad. He's in heaven now. But he was preaching one day, and I was sitting down on the second row and got the plan of the little boy, about six, seven years old, and uh, he walked. Amen. So some of you all got pretty good, you know. <laughs> I thank God that there's been a change. Because you see, you see, you see, listen. We've come, thank God, to realize that uh, church and worship is to be a celebration. When I was a boy, it looked like they made church the most unjoyable unenjoyable thing in the world. It looked like to me the more unenjoyable it was than the more religion they said you had. And see that's the difference between religion and Jesus. When you get bogged down in religion. Have I got a witness here? Religion will make you as sad as a funeral. But oh, if you come to know Jesus. When you get to church joy is in your heart. Have I got a witness here? Church and worship is to be a celebration. I had, wish I had time to talk about what we come to celebrate. We're here to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. We're here to celebrate the life of the Prince of Glory. We're here to celebrate God's forgiving power. We're here to celebrate His mercy and His grace. We're here to celebrate the goodness of God. We're here to celebrate the greatness of God. When we come to church, it ought to be a celebration. I don't know about you, but I'm not at a funeral. Have I got a witness here? I'm not here to parade some piosity. I'm not here to worship churchianity. I'm here to celebrate the risen Christ. Have I got a witness here? That's why when I get here, I don't mind saying, we have come into this house to magnify him and praise his name. That I don't mind shouting because it's a celebration. And then some people who come to a funeral, they look at us funny. Wondering what's wrong. I tell you what's wrong. It's the difference between religion and knowing Jesus. <laughs> Have I got a witness here? He said, Now the day will come when my disciples will be sad. You see, there's a time, the Bible says, there's a time for everything. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to rejoice. And when he says, The day will come that my disciples will be sad and we'll be, we'll be mourning he was referring to the time of his arrest the time of his trial the time of his sentence and crucifixion he was referring to the time of his death because the bridegroom will have been taken away he said now that's the time to rejoice but you see we're not in that time <laughs> we live on this side of Calvary and the reason why we can shout is because we're on this side of Calvary. When we look back, Friday is not dark Friday, but because we live on this side of Calvary, Friday is good Friday. Have I got a witness here? And that's enough to shout about. And then he gives us two illustrations to drive home his point. He says in verse 21, No man saw the piece of new cloth on an old garment, Else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. What he's illustrating here, he's saying that you don't take a new piece of garment that has not been pre-treated and sew it on to an old piece of garment. Because if you sew on a new piece of garment to an old piece of garment, and that new piece has not been pre-treated then when you wash it the new piece will shrink and when it shrinks it will tear and rip and ruin the old piece of gum 
Now what he's actually saying is, he's saying that he did not come into the world to tack on something new to all Judaism. He's saying, I came to bring a brand new relationship with Jesus. And you can't have it trying to hold on to the old garment of Judaism because it will tear and rip and ruin both. And then he gives another illustration to make the same point. He says in verse 22, And no man put his new wine into old bottles. Better rendition would be old wine skins. Else the new wine doth burst the skin. And the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be, will be marred or destroyed. But new wine must be put into new wine skins. Are you with me? And again, he's saying that you cannot put the old into the new. You see, in those days, they had wine skins. And the wine skins contained the wine. And if they put new wine into those old wine skins. Those wine skins would burst and you would lose both the skin and the wine. Are you with me? Now those old wine skins had a tendency of becoming hard, unyielding, and unbending. Just like we become. Have you noticed that the older you get, the more set you become in your way? Hello? Have you noticed that the longer you live, the more you adopt a certain pattern? You do, you do everything the same way every time, all day, every day. And the older you get, you see, we have to learn how to conserve energy. And so we learn the best way to do a thing and we do it that way every day. And you really get vexed when your routine is messed up. And don't have children. Because they have a way of messing up your routine. I, I put my comb in a certain place every day when I go home and undress. I put my comb in a certain place. And I got some too. If I hide it, they find it. And they don't ever ask. But they'll find it and they never put it back. And see, my routine is, you see, I can get dressed in five minutes. And I can jump in my clothes and I'm looking for my comb. And you know when they use it the most and I can't find Sunday morning. It always happens when I'm trying to go through my routine and get here on time. I've got to go all through the house looking for my comb. You know, it used to, I didn't understand why when my daddy would get in the car Sunday morning and I had had it Saturday night, that he, he would adjust it to my side. And he would get, I said, well, there ain't nothing to do but just put it back where it was. But see, at 16, I didn't have any problem making adjustments. At 42, I'm beginning to learn how he felt about keep my seat where I <laughs> Are you listening here? Do you know as Christians we can become like wineskins? Do you know the church can become like old, hard, unyielding wineskins? 
We can get bogged down in our routine. All right, you, you, we understand she has to go out, but you can give me your attention. Stay with the word. We, we can become old and hard, just like wineskins, and get into a routine. And we never want to change. And thus, God is not able to cause many churches to grow because they've gotten in a routine. You know when joy comes, when God breaks the routine. When you allow God to come in and, and, and take over. <laughs> Have I got a witness? Some of us come with our eye on the clock. And we're thinking about everything. Did I leave the roast on? Did I do this? Did I do that? But you get to know Jesus. And joy comes when you allow God to break into the routine and allow God to have his way, not only in the worship, but in your life. Have I got a witness here? You see, when you put God on a time clock, religion is boring. But when you let God have his way and he comes in with spontaneity, he'll make your life exciting. Now let me, let me close on the last one. We've looked at the association controversy. And we've looked at the fasting controversy. But there's one last one in this passage. And uh, it starts down at verse 23. And uh, there is the Sabbath controversy. And it came to pass that he went through the cornfield on the Sabbath day. And his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? Are you listening? They were on their way somewhere and they passed through a corn field. And they were hungry. And so they did what hungry people they reached out and plucked some corn and started eating. Now that was not illegal. They were not stealing and it was not dishonest. For the Jews were instructed by the law to leave the corners of their fields for strangers. And so it was perfectly legal for them to pluck some corn and eat it as they passed by. So the problem was not in the plucking of the corn. The problem was doing it on the Sabbath. And here come the religious investigators, the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh, you're breaking the Sabbath. You're doing something that is unlawful on the Sabbath day. They made a big controversy over this. Do you know that they had, the Jews had 39 separate rules of what you could and could not do on the Sabbath day related to work, 39 things, and most of which were ridiculous. Obviously, according to the text, you could not pluck corn or wheat on the Sabbath day. But worse than that, on the Sabbath day, you could spit on a rock, but you couldn't spit on the ground. You want to know why? To spit on the ground, they considered that as cultivating. You were helping the ground out to develop whatever was there. But since that couldn't happen if you spat on a rock, then they said that if you spat on the ground, it was work. You couldn't carry an orange in your pocket on the Sabbath day because that was bearing a burden. But you could cut it in half and carry half the orange. Because half an orange was not a burden. Now what is going on here? Therein you find the difference <laughs> between religion and Jesus. The difference between 
religion and Jesus is that religion brings a burden and Jesus brings a blessing. The Jews had made the Sabbath day burdensome. And Jesus says, that's, that's not what the Sabbath day is all about. And when they came and accused him of doing something wrong on the Sabbath down in verse 25, Jesus hit them where it hurt. He says, and you can feel a pinch of sarcasm. Have you not read? Well, of course they had read. They prided themselves on their religious knowledge. And you have to be careful, Concord, as you grow as a Bible church. One of the most deadly and pernicious things that can ever happen to a person and or a church is that they grow in understanding of the word and instead of growing in humility they grow in pride we get the bible at our church our pastor preaches the word and you can look down your ecclesiastical nose at other people and what you are doing you are immaturely handling the immaturities of other people which places you in the exact same category if not worse because you ought to know better Jesus says have you not read and then he reaches over into the Old Testament and gets an example of David when David and his men went into the house of God, into the temple, and they were hungry, so they ate the showbread that sat out on the golden table. And according to the law, only the priest was allowed to eat the showbread. And he says, have you not read what David did? Because he knew they revered David. He knew that they had read in 1 Samuel where it talks about what David did in the temple and yet they were hypocritical because they didn't say anything against David but they were accusing Jesus and his disciples. Have I got a witness? And so Jesus is saying, now listen, the Sabbath, down in verse 27, was not made for man. And not man, the Sabbath rather, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What Jesus was simply saying was that David and his men had a need. They were hungry. And the need was more important than the law. Are you listening? A lot of times we have certain religious laws and it doesn't matter to us who's hurting, what the need is. We can be just so pharisaical, rigid, and legalistic. Oh, we got to keep the law. Jesus said, human need takes precedent over rules and regulation. The Sabbath does not take precedent over human need. Are you listening? Let me wrap it up. The difference between Jesus and religion. Religion is to be inhibited by rules. But to know Jesus is to be inhabited by a redeemer. And I close by asking you, do you have religion? I see you here on Sunday. I see you all dressed up. You got your best behavior on. I see you working in the church. Do you have religion? Have you ever met Jesus? 
problem with religion is that it does not work. You can be in the church 30 years and only have religion. You can keep every rule and every regulation and only have religion. If you're here today and you have religion because everybody got religion of some kind, I want to introduce you to Jesus. John 1 and 12 said, But as many as received him, to him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. Religion will allow you to come to church and be a bench member. Because that's all religion is, it's membership. Religion will allow you to get to hide in the congregation because you really don't want to do anything. Religion. You can even accept a leadership role, but it doesn't mean that you know the Lord. A whole lot of people are going to go to hell right out of the church because as far as they got was religion. When you came to the church and you joined, did you just sit down in a chair did you give your hand to the preacher did they put your name on a roll did anybody lead you to accept Jesus according to Romans 10 and 9 if you confess with your mouth and believe in that heart that God raised Jesus from the dead thou shalt be saved did you confess that with your mouth if you didn't maybe you got religion But today, you can get Jesus.